How to make a 40 pound guitar feel and play like a 400 pound guitar. During this video I'll be using the Glary GT501 that I reviewed last week. And the reasons I'm using that one is one because it's available to me and two because it's a reasonably good cheap guitar that you could improve with a little bit of effort. Let's have a look at some of the issues we'll be trying to repair or at least improve. Firstly, there's the finish at the end of the frets. Each of the frets should be beveled slightly so you don't get any sharp edges which you can catch your fingers on. And the Glary was quite poor on this, the frets needed finishing off better than they were. However, there may be problems with this because if you look carefully at this neck you'll notice that they're actually out of line. Some of them are already set back so you can't really uh, angle the frets whereas some of them are sticking out further uh, which is going to make the job a little bit more difficult and it means we won't be able to quite get a perfect finish on them. Another job that will really improve the way the guitar plays is adjusting the action which is the height of the strings and looking at the guitar the action around the top of the neck i.e. from the 12th fret above is quite high and could suffer some uh, considerable lowering. However near the nut in the 1st, 2nd, 3rd fret round there the action's pretty much perfect so we don't need to adjust the action at this end. Thankfully the bridge stands quite proud so there's lots of adjustment we can do there which means this job should be fairly easy. As in order to adjust the action I have to take the bridge out and sand it down and lower it. At the same time I might as well fit a piezo pickup because for myself this would make the guitar infinitely more useful. So I've bought a supposedly Fishman preamp and pickup that I can fit at the same time. The reason I say supposedly Fishman is because I bought this preamp and pickup off eBay for around £10 which is an absolute bargain but it really does look genuine so hopefully it is. Right let's open the pickup and preamp and take a look at it first. The Fishman came packaged with an instruction manual a little bag of bits and the actual pickup and preamp itself. Right, let's take a closer look. The preamp looks okay. It's got lots of features on it, which means theoretically you should have a loss of control over the sound. The pickup is the new flexible type and the output socket is one that replaces the strap button at the end of the guitar. Right, let's take a look at what you get in the little bag. In the bag we have a Fishman on board label. We have four mounting screws and a sticky backed cable tidy with a rip tie and two mounting backings so you don't have to screw the preamp straight into the wood. And finally we have the instructions which is just the instructions on how to use the preamp once it's fitted. It's interesting that there aren't any separate instructions to show you how to fit the preamp which is probably where this video will be useful to people. And because of this I'll probably upload a separate video with just the fitting of the preamp for people who need that. Right, let's take a closer look at the preamp itself. The preamp itself is just made of plastic but this isn't a problem because it's going to live inside the guitar and you can see we've got some sort of uh, micro pot or micro variable resistor I don't know what that's about uh, and we've got a microphone actually built into the unit and where the battery goes in at the back of the uh, preamp itself there The 
The pickup itself is one of these new flexible types that I don't really like the look of but we'll see how it sounds when it's fitted and how easy it is to fit before I make a final judgement on that. The output socket is an end pin type so you remove your end pin and replace it with this which I quite like and I think that'll look quite neat when it's done. Before doing anything to the guitar, I'm going to test the preamp. Obviously, I don't want to cut the guitar to pieces and find I've got a faulty preamp. I need to test it first before I start doing anything to the guitar. So I'll put a battery in it and do a few little tests. So as a simple test, I'll just plug the preamp into my amplifier and then just rub my fingers against the microphone and the pickup and see if it makes any noise. That sounds fine but I'll just higher it a bit so you can hear it more clearly. Well this test confirms it's working okay so I can go ahead with fitting it to the guitar. In order to do any of the jobs we need to do to this guitar, the first thing we need to do is remove all the strings. So I'll go ahead and do that. To save moving the camera back and forward, I'll remove all the strings at the machine head end before moving down to the bridge. Whereas normally I'd do them one by one if I was intending to keep the strings. I'll speed this bit up. Right, as I've removed all the strings from the machine heads, I'll move down to the other end of the guitar to the bridge and remove the pegs. The pegs can be quite awkward because they can be stiff and difficult to remove. I'm using here a tool that comes with the uh, string winder. However, you can actually get a peg remover. Otherwise, I tend to use wire cutters, but you don't put any force on the pegs, you have to keep it open, but just use it to grip the end, and that works nicely. I'm guessing you could also use pliers, or anything that will help you get a firm grip on the end of the pegs. Another trick I've also used in the past that I'll show you now, is to actually bang the peg from the other side. If you stick your hand inside the hole, you can feel the back side of the pegs. And if you use the edge of uh, something metal, like uh, say the edge of these wire cutters or pliers or a very small hammer or something, you can actually tap the peg from the underside, bringing it out that way. Uh, this is quite a good way because pulling it from the top, you can break them. Whereas doing it this way, they tend not to break. Once you've removed the strings, you can either put the pegs back in the holes so you know where they are, or you can remove them completely and put them away somewhere safe in a bag or something. I'll put them back in the holes so I know where they are, and then we can start the work on the guitar. If you saw my review on this guitar, you'll remember I pointed out that the finish on the hull was pretty poor. And I've just found now, putting my hand inside the guitar, that it's quite splintery. So the first thing I'll do is tidy that up. We'll use a very fine sandpaper or wet and dry paper. Uh, it has to be very fine though. 
Whilst you're cleaning it up, it's worth noting that if you do up and down movements with it being plywood, you can cause it to delaminate and that will uh, ruin your guitar really. So do it side to side and also keep the sandpaper at an angle inside the uh, guitar so that you're rounding off the edge on the inside of the guitar and not on the outside of the guitar. Again, just so you get a clean finish when you've done. Right, I'm happy with that. It's not perfect, but it's a lot better than it was. Now let's take a look at the neck. You'll remember at the beginning of this video, I mentioned the fact that the edges of the frets weren't finished up very well. They're uh, different lengths and they have sharp edges and they should be angled slightly. So what we'll do is we'll do that first using a special tool. And this is a fret bevel and it has two diamond files on it one which is at 90 degrees which we don't need for this job and the other one which is about 60 degrees which puts an edge on the frets and angles them so that you don't cut yourself and the guitar feels nice when you're playing it you don't need the special tool to do this you can do it with a file as long as you're careful and obviously you'd have to do it one fret at a time. However, for the sake of this video and to show how I would normally do it, I'll use this tool because it's a lot quicker and more accurate if you're trying to do it at a reasonable speed. You'll notice that as well as filing the frets, I'm slightly filing the edge of the fingerboard. And this isn't the perfect scenario. If you'd fitted the frets yourself, you wouldn't allow this to happen. However, I don't have much choice in this instance, so I'll continue with that. I'm striking a balance here between uh, catching the edge of the fingerboard and getting the frets as angled and uh, well finished as possible. So um, they're not going to be perfectly finished frets, but I'm not going to ruin the fingerboard either. Before attempting to use the fret beveler anywhere near the body of the guitar you need to make sure you've got enough clearance from the frets to the body because obviously if you start filing wildly you could end up scratching the body quite badly. Once I feel I've done enough with the fret beveler I'll finish each fret one by one using a fret crowning file. And this is a file with a bevel in it so that you can shape the curve on the top of the fret so they're all the same. However, I'm just using this to take the sharp edges and the harsh edges off the edge of the frets. Using a crowning file, it means I can file quite safely without damaging the fingerboard. The trick to doing a really good job of beveling the end of your frets is to inspect a lot and file a little. You need to find the jagged edges of the frets and then file a little and re-inspect them and repeat this until you've got the frets as smooth as you want them. Don't go over the top and look for absolute perfection because you'll take too much metal off the frets. You want to take the minimum amount of metal off to get a reasonably smooth finish. At this point, I just want to demonstrate a really useful tool. However, this guitar didn't actually need it, which is a real surprise for a guitar at the price that this cost. 
And the tool I want to demonstrate is a fret rocker. Now, you use a fret rocker to make sure your frets are perfectly level. If you find you've got a buzz on one particular fret and one particular fret only, then what you'll find is that you've got a fret standing proud. And this is what we use a fret rocker for. We can find the proud fret and bring it down to the same level as all the other frets. And you do this by using it a little like a seesaw. The fret rocker has four sides on it, each one of a different length. And you find the length that will allow you to cover three frets. And you place it on the three frets and then try to rock it back and forward. If it rocks like a seesaw, then you know the fret in the middle is proud and needs to be lowered slightly. Again though, you have to take the absolute minimum off the fret and then retest it over and over again. Because if you take too much metal off the fret, you'll have to either replace that fret or re-level all the frets on the guitar. And this could take hours. So it's a really careful process, but the fret rocker shows you where you've got a problem. After you've finished working on the frets, you want to make sure any debris is removed. Make sure you get rid of any metal burrs and any metal flakes because you can get nasty metal splinters or if they're dragged across the surface of the guitar they'll leave a scratch. At this point I'll also treat the neck with almond oil and this is because I've got the strings off and it's far easier and I'll probably do it again before I put the strings back on again. The reason I treat the neck with almond oil is because it seals the wood from any grease and grime that will end up there from your fingertips. And this was the particular oil that was recommended to me by a really skilled violin maker. So I take his advice above of everyone else because I know lots of people use lots of different oils to treat the neck. But this is one he recommended to me so I stick to that one. And you can see by the state of the bottle, I've been using this type of oil for years without an issue. I'll also put a little bit of almond oil on the saddle as that wood is also open. I'll speed this bit up so it's less boring. Once the fingerboard and the saddle have been treated, they actually look a lot nicer than they did. It makes the wood go darker and it brings out the grain. The next steps in improving this guitar are to lower the action and fit the pickup and preamplifier. The reason I've brought these two steps together is when you fit the pickup you have to take 2mm off the bottom of the bridge. However, in order to lower the action we also need to take a couple of millimetres off the bottom of the bridge. So I'll bring these two things together and I'll take 4mm off the bottom of the bridge. The first thing I need to do then is mark the area of the bridge that we'll be removing and I'll do this with an indelible marker so it doesn't get rubbed off whilst I'm working on it. Obviously double check and triple check your measurements to make sure you're not taking too much off the bottom of the bridge. If you've never done this before it might be worth you getting a spare because they're literally only a couple of quid off eBay and it's good to have a spare one lying around before you start just in case you make a real mess of it. I'll be using an aluminium block with an abrasive take stuck to it. This is because I know it's completely flat. Now it's really important that the bottom of the bridge is kept as flat as possible. So you need to find something that's really flat and put some abrasive paper on top of it and use that to make sure that the bottom of the bridge comes out flat. Having an uneven bottom to the bridge will affect the sound, especially if you're using a piezo pickup. Where the bottom of the bridge doesn't make proper contact with the piezo pickup, 
you'll lose the sound being transmitted to it. So you could even end up with very quiet strings. To get a flat bottom to the bridge, hold it as flat as possible whilst you're sanding it. And obviously keep checking it so you don't go over the line and you don't take too much off. I'll speed this bit up again so it doesn't get too boring and I couldn't get a decent camera angle so you could see what I was doing. Once you've sanded down the bridge to the correct height, put it aside somewhere safe for the time being until we're ready to fit it after we fitted the pickup. Right, let's fit the preamplifier. And the first thing we need to do is decide where we're going to fit it and then mask off the entire area with masking tape. It doesn't matter if you put too much on because you'll be protecting all of that part of the guitar so it doesn't get scratched whilst you're working on it. And whilst it's a good idea to use the masking tape as protection for your guitar, the main reason we're putting it on is so we can mark out where we want to cut before we start. Once you've finished putting the masking tape on and you're happy with it, the first thing you need to do is put a centre line down the area of the guitar where you're going to put the preamp. And this is because quite often the guitars aren't actually of a uniform width. So you need to make sure it's following a center line. To make an accurate center line, you need to measure at various points along the width of the guitar and mark off the center points where you're measuring so that you end up with a series of dots. And then you need to join the dots together to create the center line. How many dots you do isn't that important, however it's probably better to do too many rather than too few, because then you'll be more likely to catch any mistakes. Remember the old rule as well, measure twice, cut once, or as I often do, measure at least twice. If you've got a template for your preamp, it's very easy now. You just line up the center of the template with the line on your guitar and stick it down where you want to put the preamp. Unfortunately, I don't have a template, so I'm going to have to work out where I'll be cutting with careful measurements. Once I've marked up the center line and I'm happy with it, I'll use the mounting plate for the preamp in order to decide where I'm going to fit it. So I'll slide it along the centre line until I'm happy with how it looks and then I'll roughly mark one edge. Then I'll mark it properly using a ruler. Try to get the final line as close as possible to 90 degrees from the edge of the guitar because we'll be using this line now to find the other edge of the preamp. To mark the long edge of the preamp, we go from the center line, and this way we can measure from the center line to the edge of the preamp on both sides. But also to confirm our measurements right and it is dead center, we can measure from the edge of the guitar to that line again. And this gives us a double check to make sure we've got it right. It's important to remember that the two edges of the preamp frame we measured earlier are the outside edges. We now need to measure the width of the frame so we know where the edge of the hole is we need to cut in the guitar. As you're marking the edge of the hole, it's worthwhile marking the fact that this is the piece of wood you'll be cutting away by doing parallel lines or something similar to make it obvious that's the area you'll be cutting away. Once you think you've done marking off the area you're going to be cutting away, before you do anything, take the preamp frame and hold it over the uh, area you want to cut 
and double and triple check it's the correct size. Once you're 100% sure you've got it right, now you can start to cook. I'm using a rotary tool with the carb random disc on to cut the hole in the guitar. And you'll notice I had to change it halfway through the job because the uh, thinner ones were breaking. So I put a thicker one on and this finished the job off beautifully. And I could even use it to sand some of the finer work at the end. What you use to cut the hole really isn't important as long as you're comfortable with it. I know some people use a standard drill and just drill lots of holes and then join them together. I know other people use uh, saws and some people use jigsaws and I even know one person who uses a Stanley knife and just cuts over the same bit again and again until it goes through. I've used the rotary tools before and I've never had a problem so this is my tool of choice. When cutting a hole like this, I always do it in three stages. Firstly, I cut a hole out that's just inside the marked area. And then I'll sand down using the power tool up to the line. And then finally, I'll start checking with the actual preamp ray and sanding down manually so that I get all the details and get it to fit perfectly. Uh, at the end, it's well worth doing it manually with a file because then you can get a far more accurate finish and also it'll be cleaner than uh, most other tools. With this particular preamp, there's a notch at the end, which is for the latch to fit into where you open the preamp to put a battery in. This part would have had to be done by hand anyway. And when you do it by hand, you get a far neater finish and it fits in with the frame really nicely. Once you've finished cutting the hole for the preamp, place the preamp or the preamp frame into the hole and fit it down as it should be. Then you can mark off the points where you want to drill the holes for the screws and by doing this way you'll get it bang on accurate. Once you're happy with the job and you've drilled the holes you can remove the masking tape and start actually fitting the preamp into place. You can see here the reason I use masking tape is because it comes off so easily and doesn't leave any residue. You can also see here that the final hole for the preamp isn't a uniform rectangle. Whilst I was finishing it off with the file I've cut a couple of slots for the hinges and a slot for the latch. This particular preamp has plates that fit on the back of the screws inside the guitar. So obviously I can't show you this being done clearly. Uh, but you have to put your hand inside the guitar and feel for the end of the screws. And then make sure these plates uh, screw onto the end of the screw. Fortunately, the way this preamp opens up for replacing the battery you can see a little bit of the uh, backing plate and a little bit of the screws so it does help you to some degree get those into place accurately but these plates are important so even if it's fidgety do the job properly Once you've mounted the preamp in place, you can start getting a real sense of satisfaction in your work because it looks really nice 
and obviously any rough edges of the wood is hidden by the frame of the preamp and it looks very professional and like a factory job. Now I'll move on to fitting the output plug and to do this firstly I remove the end pin or the strap button from the end of the guitar and I slightly enlarge the hole. This doesn't need to be done but I like to do it anyway before I put a drill bit anywhere near the guitar because I'm always paranoid about it skipping off across the surface. Once you're happy you've got somewhere to key the drill bit into just drill the hole using the recommended drill bit for the size of jack plug socket you'll be fitting. Unfortunately I can't really show you the fitting of the output socket because it's done from the inside of the guitar but you just take the nuts and bolts off the output socket from the one side then you push it through from the inside which is very fidgety and it can be very awkward and finally just put the nuts back onto the end and tighten it up. Once you've fitted the preamp and the output socket you need to now move on to the final thing which is the pickup itself. Before you fit the pickup just check the bottom of the slot where the bridge sits and check the wood at the bottom is as smooth as possible and as flat as possible. If there's any lumps or factory debris make sure it's cleaned out first. Now you drill a small hole at the very end of the bridge slot near where the bottom E string sits. Then push the pickup through from the other side and bring it over so that it sits right to the end of the bridge slot near where the top E string is so that the whole bottom of the bridge slot is filled with the pickup. Then if you can place the bridge on top of it. However, with this type of pickup, you tend to find it pushes the bridge back out again. So you need to put the strings on to hold it in place. Once you've put the strings on the guitar and put a battery in the preamp, you're ready to go. And you can see it's made this guitar look very nice. And we'll see in a minute just how it sounds. But before we do that, there was something else I didn't like about this guitar that I'm going to improve to my tastes, however this isn't everyone's tastes, and that's the back of the neck. I find this matte finish is very uh, slow, so to give it a shiny finish, I'm going to use tea cut And you literally just put some tea cut on a cloth and rub and rub, and then polish it off and repeat this until you're happy with just how shiny it is. However, take a look at the cloth because it actually takes the lacquer off the guitar. So you don't want to overdo this, otherwise you might end up down to the wood. How I decide when I've polished enough is I polish a little, clean it off, dry the neck, polish again, clean it off, dry the neck and repeat this until I'm happy with the finish I've got and the way it feels. Once you've finished polishing with the teacup, you should then finish it off with a bit of wood polish or furniture polish and this will really bring out the shine and help protect the back of the neck. So here's a summary of what I've done to this guitar to make it as good as I possibly could get it. Firstly, I've cambered and cleaned off the edge of the frets so the fingerboard feels good under your fingers. Secondly, I've treated the fingerboard. Thirdly, I've lowered the action and installed a preamp and pickup. And finally, I've polished the back of the neck so it feels faster to play. Right, now I'm going to do some tests and you can hear how it sounds using the preamp. I've already tuned the guitar using the new inbuilt tuner which is really handy and it seems to work fine. Before I do anything else, I'll just go through each of the strings one by one with an oscilloscope. Whilst this looks very technical, it's not really. I'm just looking for three things. The first thing, and the most obvious thing, is that the preamp is producing the right amount of power it should produce. Not too much and not too little. The second thing I'm looking for is that it's not clipping the waveform. 
In other words, it goes flat on the top if this has happened. And this can happen if it's producing too much power or if the battery's got a fault in it. And the third thing I'm looking for is that none of the strings produce a lot more power than the surrounding strings. You do get more power anyway from the bottom strings than from the top. Whilst this isn't an exact science, because it's affected by things like how hard you plug the string, it does give you a good idea of any issues with the installation or setup of the preamp. And this setup is well within acceptable limits. I'll just play a little bit of The Troubled Heart by Sad Fantasy, just to see what you think of the sound. I haven't actually finished working on this guitar, but this video was getting very long. So if you'd like to see more done to this guitar, or you'd like to see more videos on how to play the guitar, please like and subscribe. Thank you for watching.